this video is about um, 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 I'm just gonna scroll down I'm just gonna scroll down this page and find find what what the hell this video is about how about that how about oh she Freaking list of songs that I wrote. 100 songs in a list. See, so I'm in a second list too. But I'm just scrolling, 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 scrolling. To find which one I'm gonna make this video about. Oh, geez, this freaking whole thing about Artemat is ridiculous. I have to scroll past it now. La 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 la. Oh, keep going, keep going. La la la. Oh, jeez. So much. Scissors of Songs, Chapter 10. Um, bring me the disco game. I already did some of these actually. Um, I'll do Letterbox. Okay, this this video is about Letterbox. Okay, Letterbox by the Mepa Giants. My mother and I were at the home of some people we were visiting who had a relative with Parkinson's disease living there, and this was the first place I saw the Blues Brothers. As I was sitting there observing her selfish behavior, I wrote this song and handed it to the disabled man, who had a perfectly functional mind and fully understood the meaning of this song, which is a description of the confusion of a child molesting hypocrite. When he shared the song with his family and explained it to them, they thought he was crazy at first, but... Then they got it and decided they were grateful to have it and thanked me for blessing them with it, which I quote friends, because those were their words. The song tells a story of someone who was such an attention whore. They secretly accepted criminal charges for collecting child pornography so they could get more attention and glory to themselves, to the extent that the stigma developed further into necrophilia. An extension on this appears in another They Might Be Giants song written later in 1993 and now available on the album John Henry entitled Why Must I Be Sad which makes a reference to rows of dandelions. Dandelions don't grow in rows, unless I'm making an allusion to hanging out in a cemetery where they grow over the graves which are arranged in rows. Letterbox is an innocent song about never knowing what to expect in the mail, of course, but it was in fact extracted from these observations. This was its actual history because the implication was that inheritance earned from a family death might appear there. This is the kind of dementia my mother had, and I had no respect or tolerance for it. So I placed a letter of notification there to prevent any such letter from ever arriving. It is basically an expression of merit appropriation. These people figured this out after processing it a whole minute, then decided that I was a genius and should be immortal and assured me that the song would get to where it was going. So I know this is my work by this memory rather than my money I never received for it, which would be useful and appreciated, but again, not the ultimate intended end goal. And if I were just making this all for attention or some sort of subversive self-satisfaction, I wouldn't even really have the energy for this. It just wouldn't be there. I'm not doing this for only myself. I'm doing this for one person who wanted me to share this memory and inspired and motivated me by asking me to write this book. This That is why I am doing this, to provide an answer to that one person who asked. Um, and that person, by the way, was a girl that I was friends with on the street and Trinidad, Colorado. Um, okay, uh, now, now this video is about, now this video is, see I'm gonna do two songs in one video, how about that, how about, how about, how about I do that, is that a problem? Okay, now this video is about World War Three is a Giant Ice Cream Cone by King Missile. Written in my first year of fifth grade while attending Chicago Christian Academy. There was a Baskin and Robbins 31 flavors a couple blocks up from the school. We occasionally visited it at the end of the day. And this is one of those songs that might occur to the listener to have been evidently authored by a child. With my songs you can't always tell, but I seem to have deliberately made this one obvious. Every once in a blue moon the school would use the parlor as a class field trip destination when everyone was doing good in their grades and on good behavior. I had reached the point, however, where it was obvious that ice cream was not a reward but a war, and Miss Rubik was offended by and jealous of this song, and expressed to me that she was tired of taking my shit. My hands were empty, however, and her argument lacked context. I had no interest in what she was tired of. I had one medium by which I gained reward, and it was my songwriting, not her promise of a great future ice cream, which she could shove up her ass and take 
with her own shit. And she called my parents and told them I was demented and possessed by the devil, because she was furious that my work outranks her ego and false glory. I was informed by my dad's second wife that she said this stuff. This lady is crazy, she said, what did you do to her? I gave songs to her students, I said. Why? She said, because they were my friends, I said. They were gifts. She is jealous and she can't deal with it. Fuck her, there are other schools. She called us on the phone and just said all this crazy stuff that makes no sense. I asked her what you did and she said you made a war out of her ice cream. I busted out laughing. I'm serious. This lady is on drugs. I don't think you should go to this school. She needs to go to the mental hospital. I asked her to explain what this meant, that you made a war of her ice cream. I busted out laughing again. And she said that you traveled into the future and made little girls hang themselves from trees and stab their friends. And then the parents and teachers at another school were killing babies and feeding them back to the children in the spaghetti. And I'm not even going to repeat the rest of what she said. She is not safe to be with kids. Did she say, did she do something to you? I, I wish I tried to keep from laughing because I kept thinking about the ice cream thing. I write songs. You can do whatever you want in songs. It is like writing stories, but with music. I know what is a song, she said. She was telling me that you literally did these things. Something is wrong with her. Did you poison her? With what? I said, a piece of paper with a song written on it? How can I possibly do that? It's obviously she's already messed up. I agree with you. Did you not give her scopolamine? What the fuck is that? She was seriously checking me to figure out if someone had taught me how to devil breath someone. This is ridiculous. We're getting you out of that school. We don't want you anywhere near that lady. I told her to let me talk to the principal and she wasn't at the school she was calling me from her house seriously though i said what's scopolamine can i put it on ice cream anyway this is how i left that school and that is the backstory to world war three it's a giant ice cream cone by king missile um now in this song belongs to relatives I visited with my mom. The reference dishes were metaphorical, referring to anything offered, recognition, respect, food, whatever was broken by her oblivious disregard for anything outside of herself. To the extent that everything had to always be about her, and I never got to get to know those family members. This song appears at the end of a movie starring Steve Mishimi called Ed and His Dead Mother that I likely piloted that same year. I'm not really sure at the moment, but I seem to have a vague memory of doing this. Unless this is the case, direct references to dead mothers are not a reoccurring theme in my work. In Family Guy, for example, it is only a wish carried by the baby, Stewie. Reference to the incident that inspired the writing of Decomposing Trees occurs in this song at Float Upstream. Draw the line dividing laugh and scream, and then addressing Brick, who at this point was still technically unborn. You know everything I know, so I know you've heard the voice that makes a silent noise that says, but this is not a doom tune because the ending refrain makes, marks the fulfillment of well, the end of this particular song. Um, okay, now this video is about the backstory to Particle Man by the Mother Giants. I wrote this song in third or fifth grade, I don't remember which. These were consecutive grades for me because I was skipped over fourth. I sang it for my peers so they would know and remember the melody. I have three freckles on my right wrist over the place where a wristwatch would be. Positioned in a way as to indicate clock hands. It was third grade, I remember now, because I remember Miss Rubik reciting various lyrics from it, and trying to use them as arguments before I cast her into a hell where she was in a school called Christ Church where all the kids were routinely obligated to attend satanic rituals involving sexual abuse and infanticide, which was followed by the drinking of the blood of the murdered infants, and the consumption of their flesh in the school lunches to shut her up, which ultimately worked as it resulted in my removal from the school. Triangle Man is a direct reference to the Illuminati, which didn't do intimidate me as I understood the dynamic and used it habitually for dimensional mobility. Okay, this video is now about the backstory to Garbage Party by King Missile, written in 1985, before I left CCA, before my song suddenly occurred to the assistant principal to bear sinister ulterior motives. She had been praising their imaginativeness and ingenuity and permitting them to leave the school, which she regretted. 
regretted in retrospect after realizing they were all not only laughing at her behind her back, but also directly in her face. This song came up in her monologue when she phone conferenced my parents. Although my dad and his second wife determined she was mentally ill, my own biological mother took Rubik's position and told her acquaintances I was a threat to society ever since. For those who are fans of those songs, the nature and dynamic of that issue requires no explanation. However, of course, that no conspiracy ultimately exists, which is what terrified those people. Exposure and truth effectively crosses out. These are the people who cling to and brood on things that have been resolved, changed, and passed. These are the people trapped inside the Mandela Effect, or more accurately, the paradigm shift. The can of beans they are trapped in is now branded Van Camps instead of Vandy Camps. And they can't get over it to the point where they build websites committed to it, and those sites are cemeteries. Other King Missile songs they wrote this year include Heaven, I'm Sorry, Trapped, The Dishwasher, The Evil Children, Fourthly, Mystical Shit, Take Stuff From Work, Up My Ass, No Point, How To Remember Your Dreams, Rock and Roll Will Never Die, Martin Scorsese, The Sandbox, Sink, The Boy Who Ate Lasagna and Could Jump Over a Church, The Indians, The Little Sandwich That Got a Guilt Complex Because He Was The Sole Survivor of a Horrible Bus Crash, and, and, Mr. Me, Cowtown, Dinner Bell, Birds Fly, Nightgown of the Solemn Moon, 32 Footsteps, Turn Around, which describes how you're feeling, Hearing Aid, The Sun is a Mass of Incandescent Gas, alternately titled White as the Sunshine, in some parallel timelines, and The Spiraling Shape by They Might Be Giants is now what this video is about, the back series too. These songs were all written in 1986 while in my second fifth grade year in Susan Green's class and turned in directly to Susan Green. If she's still around, she is very old now. I guess I should note here that although I may have written a notable collection of They Might Be Giant songs and gave them their band name, they have also written their own songs which share musical style elements but not my songwriting style and my energy is not present in them. In case anyone reading this was born yesterday and is under the impression that I'm delusional for believing I write They Might Be Giant songs. Like this one YouTube show pretending to be a Mandela Effect researcher reporting that I claim to write Nirvana songs because I mentioned it in Bloom, and a comment posted under a video of, of his claiming that the lyrics have changed. The issue that I've never received any money for these works is one thing, but for some channel to claim that someone working for CERN has changed the lyrics to my song in Bloom to what they've always been for the purpose of manipulating the stock market is obviously retarded, and the only reason I think it's even worth mentioning is because of the irony. Okay. Um, time to rock. My back is what this video is now about. The backstory to written in May of 1993 in Ann Arbor and appears on an unpublished cassette titled Bogus Flow, which I found online in 2018 and didn't recognize anything on it at first until my memory came back to me while hearing some of the lyrics and remembering sitting there in my room on that green couch writing them. Okay, now I am um, making this video about Chop Suey by System of a Down. Okay, here's the backstory to that song. Alonzo Stagg High School in Palos Hills, Illinois, and handed to a couple Arabs who were in a couple of my classes. They were very enamored to be in the possession of this song and behaved as if it were the most valuable thing they had. If I remember their names, I might call them and say hi, but I don't. And between now and when I created System of a Down, I never met any of the band either. Shop Sui was the name of an Asian restaurant on North Avenue near my mother's apartment on McVicker Street that I visited in early childhood with her. I was around five or six years old. The song references observations I made as I sat there attempting to relax and enjoy the meal but failing on account of being perpetually clowned and assaulted for attention by my mother. She got into some static with another jet diner she struck a conversation with and called her out after seeing the nature of her behavior, and we left early as a result, although I'd barely ate. This was the first time I encountered Baby Octopus, 
They were on the buffet with lemon slices and served cold in a metal bowl on top of ice. They were delicious. There was a certain way to do those that the rest that and that restaurant knew how to do it. Anyway, this band was given its title from the memory of this day because although it wasn't the first time I made this observation, it was the first time in my memory I was able to convey it to another person in the world that no interaction with this person of any description created a functional system. I later explained to this to the Arab I gave the song to. I later explained this to the Arab I gave the song to, and he was terminally interested in everything I had to say from that point forward. I don't know if it was because he had a similar experience at home or because he was a black sheep who could relate, but he coincidentally happened to be sitting there when I stumbled into a page in my history textbook with a picture of Muhammad the Twelfth and realized what my great 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 grandfather said about the resemblance. He looked at the photo, looked at me, then ran to inform the other Arab kid what happened here. They had been involved at that time in a debate over who was going to come back first, Jesus or Muhammad, and I said, what if they both came back at the same time because it turns out they're the same person? What if Pope Alexander's decision to commission Da Vinci to paint his son Cesare as the son of God carried a different motive than hiding the true identity of Christ? What if Jesus Muhammad was himself the one who ordered that commission as a means of permitting people to dismiss their old world sexual inhibitions in the process of having sexual fantasies about him and reincarnating him into his selected new gene pool? What if Jesus is actually a deer instead of a lamb and works somewhere as a sports team mascot dressed in a fur suit? What if Jesus gives really good head and all you have to do to get some is ask? What if I told a guy who didn't believe in the Mandela effect that he was born with a silver spot on Darth Vader's nose? What if my cell phone is a piece of dog shit? What if your car drove automatically while it sucked your dick? What if Peter Pan was actually cool and not a lamer? What if Poo Poo and Doo Doo were brothers? Chop suey, the Arab kid echoed. Exactly, I said. If you have a complaint, it better be a valid one because I happen to love the rain and know how to use a crock pot. I especially love the way it turns bones into mashed potatoes. Okay, that is the backstory to Chop Suey by System of a Down. Um, and there's another list of 100 songs that I wrote. Okay, um, Half, Half by Soundgarden. Okay, this video is now about Half by Soundgarden. Um, and what am, what am I doing here? Okay. And now I'm reading this, Half by Soundgarden. There's a lot of memory on this song still, but I haven't surfaced enough to verbalize due to time constraints. From what I've gathered through scattered media sources, Soundgarden's original drummer was an alcoholic, which he said developed as a temporary method to handle impatience, but eventually led to the band's breakup. I remember that his drumming style was compared to the sound of someone falling off the stairs. The way I remember that I wrote this song is that it references the Richard and Allison incident on McVicker Street, where Mr. Fold, Mr. Has kills Mr. Empty Hand was something that Richard said in reference to his D&D club, who he also frequently boasted his, this quote to during sessions. He was always interested in sharing his personal thought extensions on whatever I myself shared whenever encountering him in the hall or outside. And on this particular day, he was holding a sphere that had a kinetic manipulation mechanism inside it that created muscle tension in the hand it was being held in and was made as an exercise device, which he pet named what sounded like Mr. Fool. But he slurred the word, so it so also sounded like Mr. F like Fool because he was intentionally demonstrating the synchronicity of this language dynamic with its effect in the physical world. And as you can see, I never forgot this. My mother's second husband was a guy I summoned in effort to divert more of her direct attention off of me and was someone she mentioned from her past who she went on to high school with and was the first boy she kissed as well as someone one of her local distant relatives knew so he wasn't difficult to look up and so that is what I suggested she do. After only two weeks from when they'd gotten in contact he was locked into an agenda involving marrying her within the month and I gave him fair warning that if he followed through with this plan she was going to push him down a flight of stairs, then kill both his parents while he was unconscious, and then him. He dismissed this warning and my suggestion of just living with her for a year to see if he even got that far. 
So those things occurred. I remember that I was somewhere between two and five years old when she pushed my own father down a flight of stairs and I summoned this drummer to play this way, an effort to create a time loop that would cause her to encounter her own self near a flight of stairs, get into a fight, and push herself down said stairs once and for all. So far as I'm aware, this has not yet occurred. However, when this new dude married her, I was near the end of my life as a minor, and this happened in May of 1993. This song was about me offering this guy half a chance, which I didn't actually do, which is why the song sounds mocking. When he hit the bottom of the staircase, his head hit a wall corner and his skull cracked. Technically what happened is he was drunk and attempted to retrieve his cat from the staircase on the way to his bedroom from his garage office, but wasn't as coordinated as the cat in the dark. The staircase led to the basement where I slept and I heard him fa fall and immediately go unconscious and proceed to snore but didn't bother to get up for a whole minute until I realized he might need help and I might be responsible for killing him if I didn't check the damage. So, I stepped over him and woke my mom upstairs to inform her what, a, to inform her what occurred, which, which was probably dumb, as I could have just called a bus from the get-go and, and she slept through everything, but instead, she went down there to investigate. And her reaction was to just stand there, feigning shock through more obvious amusement than acting like she was supposed to say a prayer. I scratched my head and said, right, never mind, I'll call them then. If I hadn't done so, she, he'd have died that day. But the paramedics showed up right away in response to the codes I used and hauled him off. At first, he refused to go. After they woke him up, shined light in his face, kept him conscious, and argued with him for a whole minute until I finally walked up and said, Right, so these doctors are on a deadline because that four-foot diameter puddle of blood on the floor came out of a crack in your skull, in case no one explained this because of some liability. I personally recommend trusting them for the night and following their directions. He made it, but then killed himself via alcoholism about ten years later, and I saw this reflected in that very blood as I hung back at the house mopping it off the floor and remembering when I wrote this part of the script while in Ann Arbor. I had spent some time on an extension involving adjusting my eyes to minimal light and doing stuff in the dark like a cat until the dude caught me one day and asked what I was doing in the dark. I'm training my eyes to work like a cat, I replied, which was the truth, and even continued to say, don't try this yourself and blame me if you fall down the stairs. I knew in that particular scenario, however, that this is exactly what he would do in response, taking it as a personal challenge, and he knew that I knew this, and followed me into the program because he wanted to know what I knew. When he returned home, and he had stitches in his head, and was a bit spaced out for a while. He expressed concern for his father, who lived with his mother a few blocks down the road, and was supposed to be in a secure supervised medical facility, because he was on dialysis and had a stent in his arm that posed a risk but he was just sent home by the system. If something happens at night and the phone rings and it's my mom, wake me up so I can go over there and help, he said. And he brought me to his folks' place and introduced me to them. Put a phone by the bed with the ringer locked on, I said, and he did that. But for whatever reason, that stent did break as a result of him scratching at it one particular night, and no one answered the phone. I was sleeping in the basement, dosed up on psychotropic medications, and... They were in their room upstairs where not one but two phones were fully functional. Regardless, that next morning he went to his garage office where he checked his answering machine to hear his mother screaming in horror through multiple call attempts as blood spewed out of the old man's arm until he was finally dead and hauled off. He was close to his father and was naturally very depressed about this, but did his best to keep a level head while sitting at the kitchen table counting stacks of quarters. The old man left hidden in jars under his side of the bed as my mom sat, him, sat beside him snatching at them and making vain and obnoxious comments and trying to coerce me into getting involved with this. I don't need your husband's money, I asserted. He has children and I have my own sources. That computer I bought with money I made from my job at McDonald's that I sit in front of downstairs was used to publish an animated website. If you don't believe it, call my producers. And in either case, we're done talking about it. After another round of standoff, harassment, and assault, I was finally told to leave, which I then still had to dodge bullets to accomplish. But I cleared and advised him to do the same. His outlook, however, involved taking the till death to us part element of his marriage vows literally. So I offered a router out of that psychology 
with one of his lawyers standing by that made perfect sense to him and resulted in his success in finalizing a divorce a little further down the road, at which point my mom changed her last name to Anderson to match Richard Dean Anderson, the actor who played MacGyver. She had a crush on and fantasized about marrying, as if that would somehow actually ever be possible, and she had half a chance. Handing someone a glove as a way of hiding your exit route, a handed glove hides the door, is a metaphor in direct reference to MacGyver. The monarchs had an organization called the CIA that, according to historical documentation, became convinced that they had been infiltrated by a mole. So, in response, they developed a mind control program called MKUltra, which was then infiltrated by the same mole. The, the program is nonsense from any angle you look at it, but it works to some extent on people who fell for mythology, which, at least during the time of this thing's conception, was a lot of people. MKUltra also went by a variety of pseudonyms, such as MK Naomi and Hap, yeah, Hap, which refers to the condition the person assumes as a result of accepting the state of desire. In other words, when you want something, this is what happens to you. I wrote this song to remember this, because when I remember this, I remember everything. Desire blocks memory, remember that. And your memory is all you are and all you have. Well, I suspect that I have another 100 songs, so maybe I'll just keep going until I stop finding them. Okay. I'm just gonna go ahead and stop. Thank you for listening.